I was going to say good morning, but I wouldn't say that, would I? It's 12 o'clock. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to the brown bag here today. These these things are great, aren't they? I mean, mm -hmm. think about it. They're, they're wonderful to attend. Um, I would be at more of them, but my wife's off on Friday, and she works here, so we spend time together. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the firearms that have come into the museum by just people that stepped through the door. You know, uh, my uncle owned this, or my father was in World War II or something like that. I don't know what to do with it or I found it in a closet and it ends up here at the museum and that's it's wonderful. But before I do talk to you about these firearms, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking to you and I do this every time I do a firearms presentation on gun safety, okay? This is a very important topic. I think everybody, even everybody needs to be refreshed on it from time to time. Um, when I was a little boy, okay, I had a slingshot. And I wore out a lot of inner tubes replacing them. And uh, I wanted a BB gun pretty bad. Is this thing? Yeah. Yeah. No. All right. I wanted a BB gun really bad. And you've seen the movie The Christmas Story. Well, that was me. Okay. I wanted that really bad. And my father, who told me when I, he gave me my slingshot, he said, anything that breathes, don't shoot at it. So that was, that was the rule. I could shoot tin cans, paper targets, whatever I wanted. But when it came to, you know, things that breathe, birds, you know, the cat next door, stuff like that, I wasn't allowed to do that. Of course, when he went to work, but I won't talk about that. But anyway, <laughs> we get back to the BB gun. I wanted that BB gun pretty bad. And he sat me down one day and he said, if you want this gun, you need to learn how to handle a gun, you know. And he said, there are four rules to gun safety. He said, and if you follow these four rules, you'll never have a mishap with a firearm. He told me that. And he said, do you remember the story of Moses? And I said, yes. And he said, do you remember the story of the burning bush? And I said, yes. And he said, well, consider that what you're about to hear is coming from the burning bush. <laughs> And if I ever catch you while you're living under this roof, breaking any of these four rules, there's going to be more than a bush burning. And I knew exactly, this was the seminal yes sir moment, okay, not okay pop, you know. He said so, rule number one, all guns are loaded, all the time. And I thought to myself, well, I've seen my father unload guns and clean them after we went hunting. <coughs> And I, as kids do in those days, you know, and he said, what? And I said, well, Dad, you've unloaded some guns. I've seen you do it. He said, son, when I take a gun apart to clean it, it's not a gun anymore because it can't shoot. But the minute I put it back together, it's loaded again. And I said, well, that kind of sounds kind of magical. He said, it is, but that gun is loaded. He said, if I load my gun and I set it down, and I walk away and turn back around, it's loaded again. If it's unloaded and I turn around and spin back again, it's loaded again. And that's the way it is. All guns are loaded all the time. And then he said, what do you think is the first thing a law enforcement officer hears, or a paramedic hears, or whoever gets there first at an accidental shooting? I did it. No, it was loaded. He said, you don't have that excuse, and I don't either, because they're all loaded. He said, if someone tells you my gun is loaded, say, I expect it to be. Just like you have gas in your car, I expect you to have gas in your car. Your gun is loaded. He said, if someone hands you a firearm, check it. If I, he said, your father hand you a firearm, check it to make sure. You know, check it. And, you, and I'll, I won't trust you, and you don't trust me, and all guns are loaded. Check them to make sure they're unloaded. He said, that's the first rule. He said, the second rule is never point your gun at anything you're not willing to destroy. Never point your gun at anything you're not willing to destroy. It wasn't long ago I was in a um, gun shop here in northern Indiana. I won't say which one, but it was a Sunday, and I was walking down the hallway towards the... Okay, I we got it. <laughs> I was walking down the hallway towards, towards the gun cases, and there was a young man behind the counter. I brought this with me. It's not a gun. It's a piece of plastic that looks like a gun. But he was cleaning 
the guns behind the caves. And I'm, as I'm walking up the aisle, he goes, hey, how's it going? <laughs> and man, I, I jumped all over this poor kid. And I said, you don't ever point a gun at me. And he said, he was very contrite. And he said, well, it's not loaded. Rule number one, rule number two, right out the window. Okay? This happens. Um, so that's rule number two. Rule number three is keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. Keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. Our hands were born to do this, grip. When our mother's holding us as a little child and, and someone sticks their finger down, we grab it. That's how our hands work. But when it comes to when it comes to firearms, we keep our finger straight alongside the firearm. We do not run around like they do in the movies like this. We do it like this. When you come up on your target, that's when you put your finger in the trigger guard. When your finger comes off, it goes straight. Um, I spent a little bit of time, about 12 years in law enforcement, and I took a lot of training down at, at Grissom at the North Central Indiana Law Enforcement Training Council. And uh, I don't know if it's still there or not. It used to be. And... Um, you always were available or able to walk into the place with your firearm on as long as you had your shield with you. And I was going through the door one time and there was a great big sign on the glass door and it said, all officers, your handguns have to be unloaded and kept in your holster while you're on the property. And I'm like, what's that all about? You know. So when I got inside, I walked up to the woman that ran it and I said, what's the deal with the gun thing out on the front door? And she said, well, an officer was going into the bathroom to relieve himself, and he took off his Sam Brown and went and reached down to pull his pistol out, and he stuck his finger in the trigger guard and shot a hole in the floor in the bathroom. And I don't know why, the first thing I thought of, can you imagine how long that man's ears rang? In a stall in a bathroom, you know. Luckily, no one was hurt, but there was a, you know. These things do happen because people forget to keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. And the fourth rule was um, know your target and what's beyond it. That's the fourth rule. Um, I am a member of the gun club here. Well, I call it whatever it's called here now, but it used to be called the gun club, but here in Plymouth. And I went down there one time back in the 1970s, to tell you how old I am. I went down there in the 70s to do some shooting. And the range used to be on the west side of the property, and now it's on the east side. And I noticed when I got to the range, there was a car on the top of the hill. But there was no one at the range besides me. So now there's two cars, but just one person. And I thought, I wonder where that other guy's at. You know? I thought, well, maybe two cars showed up, and they went out for lunch, and they were going to come back. You know. So I went down there, and I'm putting my you know, targets up on the target stands. And I went back, and I loaded my, my uh, handgun, and I put it in my holster. And for some reason, I don't know why, I walked over and looked behind the target stands. And they used to have, on the backstop there was like uh, terraced uh, ties, like railroad ties. And there was a guy laying back there sleeping with his hands behind his head. And I said, I woke him up and he was, oh, hi. And I said, uh, I'm going to do some shooting. I said, I don't think I want to with you laying back there like that. And I, you know, I've got kind of a, you got to kind of be careful what things I say sometimes. I say things I shouldn't say. I, I felt like I asked him if he sleeps on railroad tracks too, but I didn't, you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, so anyway, I, I, I said, you know, that's probably not the greatest place in the world to relax. He goes, well, there's no one, there's no one else here, you know? <laughs> anyway, uh, but, but know your target and what's beyond it. That's the point. Um, I'll tell you what, another little story. When I was 18, there was a girl lived down the street, and I went to go to her house. And I didn't need my car. So I hopped out of the house, took off, went down there. And when I got back to the house around 2 o'clock in the morning, I realized I didn't have my keys with me. And I thought, man, how am I going to get in? So I thought, well, I know how to kind of open these doors up, or the windows, I mean, downstairs. So I'm down there in the basement, and I'm trying to get this window open. And I finally got it up high enough that I could get my feet, you know, in through the... And just as my feet hit the floor inside the house, I hear, chunk. <laughs> which is the sound of a 12-gauge round being chambered into it. And I yelled at the top of my lungs, don't shoot, it's me, it's me, it's Smokey, don't shoot, it's me, it's me. And I knew who it was. And the light came on, and my father's standing there like that, with a 12-gauge shotgun. 
He said, it's a good thing I don't shoot at sounds. <laughs> you know, so we don't, yeah, if you're walking through, if you're hunting and you hear something crashing on the other side of the fence, it could be a deer or it might be the farmer that lives over there. Or the kid. Could be anything, but you don't shoot at sounds. Know your target, know what it is. Those are the four rules of gun safety. I've followed them my whole life. I have never harmed anyone. I don't ever want to harm anyone. Are those four rules written down because that's exactly how I was taught? I, in my father's mind yeah. and in his heart, they were. Somewhere along the way, that must have been written down because that's exactly how it was. You know, so. Yeah. And I suppose his father taught him that way and his grandfather or whatever taught him that way. And I wish every father, whether he owns a firearm or not, would teach their child that. We'd probably be in better shape. Yes? I was just going to make a real quick comment. Um, I got a BB gun too when I was seven. And uh, what my dad did, not only the same rules, but he, before gave me, me the BB gun, he showed it to me, he actually made a mock-up with a broomstick, with a little movable trigger with a broomstick. And I had to learn everything with the broomstick and pass this test with Stick before we went to the Excellent. Excellent. You, you had a father that was very responsible. That's the way it should be. So those are the four rules of gun safety. And now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the firearms. As I said earlier, these come in here in a gun case or something. What am I going to do with this thing? And I was asked uh, uh, several years ago, would you go down to the safe and make sure they're all safe? And I did that. Uh, I've been around guns all my life. Uh, my father owned several. Uh, my grandfather was a law enforcement officer all his life. My great-grandfather was a law enforcement officer all his life. So, uh, and he had a huge collection, and so did my grandfather. So I've been around them all my lifetime. Um, but I've never gotten into muzzle loading. Okay, so I'm going to go in kind of chronological order here with <laughs> these firearms from oldest to newest. Okay, um, I've never been into muzzle loading. I know a lot of people that do. I've fired a lot of muzzle loaders but I've never uh, owned one, you know. So, and when I got into the safe and started looking around, I see this thing and I'm like, what in the world is that? You know, and uh, the more I looked at it, I, I couldn't, I'd never seen anything like it, you know. And then I got to thinking to myself, what's the old saying? Necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. And in the 1700s, a flintlock rifle, you had one shot and that was it. Unless you carried a pistol and you had to be up close to use it. You had one shot. So the old saying of aim small, miss small meant a whole lot. Because if you needed to feed the family and there was a big old deer there, you wanted to make sure you hit it, you know, because you had one shot. And by the time you reload it, that guy's gone. I mean, he's a deer don't stand there when people are shooting at him. They, the noise just makes them run. Someone, and I did as much deep research on this as I could, someone came up with the idea over in Europe. Why not put, again, invention, two barrels on a flintlock rifle? This thing is in pretty poor condition, okay? This is a swivel breech flintlock rifle. I'd never even heard of one of these things before, okay? Um, again, a man back in those days carried not only this, or a rifle, a musket, a flintlock, but he also carried a knife and a, a fairly good sized knife most times and a tomahawk. And the reason is if he missed his prey, being another man or an Indian or something, he could, if he could get there before they could reload with his knife and his tomahawk, he could finish the person off. And that's the reason a lot of those guys carried, the, carried them. But this thing here, it's interesting, you load both barrels I think this is about 36 caliber. You load both barrels and you, you would cock the hammer, put some powder in a pan, fire the first shot, then you grab the trigger guard and pull back and turn it over. It, okay, so my other barrel's already loaded, so I pull my flint back, flint block, block back, powder in the pan again, and now I've got two shots. This is pretty cool, you know? How rare so, is that? Pardon me? How rare is that? This one probably is pretty rare, I would say. It's not in very good shape, okay, but it's probably pretty rare. Um, 
I looked it over as much as I could, looking for proof marks or anything. The all the background on it, I've been able to read. These were the French and the Germans argue over who invented this. Okay, but uh, I would probably, if it were me, I'd probably slide more towards the Germans. They were prolific gun makers, and they always marked everything with proof marks or something. This one doesn't have any marks on it, so I'm thinking it may very well have been made by a, a person in Pennsylvania, okay? That's where most of the Kentucky rifles were built, in Pennsylvania. So I'm, I'm thinking it probably was. But this is called a swivel breech flintlock. Now, there's a upside to owning this, because you, what you get? You got two shots. There's a downside, too, okay? This thing has two barrels, and they're made out of steel, and it is heavy. Okay, I wouldn't want to march around the woods all day with this thing. All right, I just soon have my savage axis. I mean, it doesn't weigh half of what this thing does. But uh, it gave you two shots. I mean, faster than another guy could load and load and load his rifle. So that was the upside and the downside. And this just says when you went into the safe. What safe are you talking about? We the museum here has a large gun safe, and all the firearms are kept in it. And just so everyone knows, they are the property of the museum, and they are not for sale. So if anyone's going to ask that, they're not. And that is a flintlock. This is a flintlock. And yes. the, the hatch in the back is for flints. I believe it is the use for that, or yeah, I would say so because it's awfully small. I don't think you could keep a whole lot of shot in there, but I, but uh, yeah, that's probably is for the flints. I would imagine. Again, I'm not, yeah. I'm not a flintlock or, or a old muzzleloader guy. So that's the first rifle or, that I'd like to show you. Very interesting. The second one is a handgun. Now, when we hear the name Eli Whitney, we think of the cotton gin. We think of an inventor, someone who invented things. Well, in 1856, when Samuel Colt's patent ran out on the revolver, a whole bunch of companies jumped in and said, we need to make a little, this guy's been making cash on this, we need to too. Um, and if anyone has ever, hasn't known this, um, Samuel Colt invented the revolver, okay? And he got the idea, he was a sailor on a ship before he was, well, you gotta make money somehow, all right? He's a sailor on a ship, and he would watch the helmsman turning the wheel on the ship, back and forth, port and starboard. And it got thinking in his mind, what if I made a cylinder and I indexed the, the load in each cylinder, I could make a six shot or seven shot, whatever he was thinking. And that's where he got the idea for the revolver from the helmsman's wheel on the ship. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, he, uh, but so anyway, when his patent ran out, there were a lot of people jumped into the fray. Eli Whitney died, but his son was, a, was the uh, CEO of Whitney Arms. And they sat down with a gentleman named Fordyce Beal, who was a gun designer. And he sat down with him and they built the Whitneyville Navy model pistol, percussion cap. Now we're out of the flintlock era, we're into the percussion cap era. These were made in the 1858. There were approximately 35,000 of them made. This firearm was used in the Civil War by both sides. More by the north, because Whitney Arms was in New Haven, Connecticut, and that's in the north. So they sold a lot more. In fact, they had a contract with the Army in 1862 and sold the Army 6,700 of these. Okay? Um, this was no doubt probably, I mean, it could have been purchased from Whitney Arms to a citizen. This wasn't in the Army or something. But there's a very good chance this, this pistol was in the Civil War. The South used this pistol also. Um, because they were able to purchase them individually, not by the, you know, they didn't sell them to Confederate Army, but they sold them to individuals in the South, even during the war. So, and I suppose after a battle, people could pick up anything you wanted, you know, hey, that guy's got a nicer gun than mine, and take it, you know, uh, for someone who's been killed or whatever, or left on the battlefield. But this is the Whitney Revolver, and this, this is a kind of interesting. In those days, most percussion cap, ones that Colt built, did not have a full frame. This has a full frame around the cylinder, for, for they believe, for safety's sake. If you were to look at an old Colt, and this is an old Colt, it's only 
but only is from three quarters of the way, so the front, the bottom, the top. It doesn't have the frame over the top of the cylinder. And that's what that's how Colt made them. He believed that was safe enough. And the son of Eli Whitney said, no, we're going to make a full frame revolver. And if you ever see an 1858 Remington, it looks a lot like this. And the reason is, Fordyce Beale left Whitney Arms and went to Remington and got a job. That's why these, that firearm and this one looks a lot alike, because the same man was the one who designed it. So that's the Whitney 36 caliber Navy revolver. Is it numbered? You know, it's... It says E. Whitney, North New Haven on it. I don't see any serial number. I think it might be underneath the grip. On the, they, sometimes they put them. Show, the, show them how that. Under the loading lever. Yeah, show them how that works. That's really cool. Oh, it might be serial number. Yeah, it, it, I don't know if anybody's ever. I, do, I don't do a lot of muzzle loading, but the balls go in, the sun, and then you put, and the, or the powder, or the, and then the ball, and then you push each one of them down all the way into the cylinder, and then you move the next cylinder up, and you push the next one down, put the, and you push the next one down. That's what the plunger's for. Um, three, nine, yeah, there's one under there, 28039. 28039. I've got a book at home that uh, has the numbers and everything, and I don't know if it has the serial numbers. To, you know, kind of check that. See if it was. 28039, yeah. Um, the next firearm I'm gonna show you is a rifle. Um, in the 1800s, let's call it the 19th century, we were living in an age like today where everything was advancing quickly. The Industrial Revolution. I mean, people were inventing things all over the place. In America, you were free to figure out anything, and people were doing it. And they were probably walking around going, wow, that's neat. That's something new. Or we'd look at it and go, look how old that is, you know. Um, this is a, called the One War Rifle, used by the United States military in the Spanish-American War, the Boxer Rebellion, and in the Philippine Insurrection. It's called the Craig Jorgensen Rifle. It's a 30 caliber bolt-action rifle, and it is, um, there were 500,000 of these made. This one was made in 1901. So we had the Spanish-American War from April to, I think, October of 1898. It wasn't very long, six months. And this is the rifle that Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders used in the Spanish-American War. Um, it loads, instead of having a stripper clip in the top, I'll show you that on the next one, it loads through the side, it has a side gate. You fold it open. They used to carry a cartridge belt with 50 rounds in it. This is a five-shot rifle. You would pull a bullet out, put it in, pull the middle of them out, and put it in. Then when you close, the, you put five in, you close this, a spring pushes all the bullets up and puts them in the top part of the breech. So when you shut the bolt, okay, and lock it down, you get your, your, load, your, your round is loaded. Um, has a safety on it. Uh, it's called 3040 Craig. Craig Jorgensen, Craig it was a captain in the Norwegian Army, and Eric Jorgensen, his name was Ole Craig, and Eric Jorgensen, who was a gun designer, designed this rifle. This was the first bolt action rifle the United States ever used. It is also the first smokeless powder. They didn't use black powder on these. This was the first smokeless powder rifle that the United States used and made. They had some trials. They had some trials in um, at Springfield Armory and and uh, or wherever they had them at, and they wanted a bolt action rifle because this was the newest thing. Before we used this rifle, we were using a single shot Springfield Trapdoor 4570, which was a single shot rifle, and everybody said, "Wow, this thing shoots five times," you know. So yeah, so uh, they, the the military wanted it pretty bad. So this one won the trial against five other guns, and um, it's, this thing's in pretty decent shape, really. Um, I, 
I ran the serial number on it. It was made in 1901. And I'll talk a little bit about the Philippine Surrection here after a little while. It's kind of interesting there, too. So that's the Craig Jorgensen rifle. So what year did they start using cartridges? All the first oh, ones were all... Oh, far long before that. Um, well, we, in the Civil War, we had mini, mini balls. So those were getting close to a cartridge. They weren't a cartridge yet where you tore off the paper and dumped everything down the barrel. Spencer's. I would probably say around 18, the Henry rifle, the Henry, everybody hear me? Okay. The Henry rifle used a cartridge, but it was a rim fire, 44 caliber rim fire. That's probably the first cartridged gun. And that was right near the, right at the end of the Civil War from 18, about 64 and 65. Well, um, during the Civil War, they were. They had a firearm that would shoot, yes, uh, bullets. Right. With you loaded and stuff, right? And, you know, and it's sort of interesting. I don't think you mentioned it, but they on the revolver they put grease at the end to keep them from all exploding at the same time. Or right? Wasn't that wasn't that the idea of the grease of, on the end of them? I, I believe so. Not being a muzzle loader guy or, or a percussion cap guy, that's very well could be true. But they I, greased the end of them, and yeah, I don't. They only fired one. Yeah. Um, well, this. Yeah, this fires six times. I mean, if you cock it each time, but right. Yeah, but, yeah. Each Flash one had grease at the end, right? At the nipple there? Is that what he's no, talking no, about? No, the, in the, in the, on the back side of it, where oh. because it's open. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That you, yeah, what they call flashover, go to the next cylinder. But it's, yeah, that it, would that it, would be ugly. Yeah, 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 you wouldn't yeah. want that to happen. You might lose fingers on that. Yeah. <laughs> and people did, believe it or not, back then. Um, but that was our first bolt action rifle, our first cartridge rifle, our first rifle using smokeless powder. They added nitrous cellulose to the powder, and if you've ever seen a black powder gun go off, my goodness, it's just a bunch of smoke, okay? And these do, they're not smokeless, they do smoke, but nowhere near like a black powder. The other thing that's interesting is it upped the power of the bullet coming out the barrel by two thirds. So you had cartridge bullets were much more powerful than the old, you know, put them in one at a time type thing where, where you don't have a, an actual cartridge, the black powder pistols. It's right. Right. Yeah. So, um, nitrocellulose, now we got a more powerful, less smoke out of the barrel. Again, this is just nothing but uh, the mother of invention. People are inventing, 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 and getting more and more and more. This next rifle is a German Mauser. This is called the Gewehr 98. This rifle is German. It was made in Oberndorf in 1916, right in the middle of the First World War. Um, Paul Mauser, the man who invented this rifle, was an artilleryman. And he understood how the inside of an artillery piece worked. I mean, obviously you would if you fired artillery. You'd know exactly how it worked. And he said, how can I incorporate that type of safety into a rifle? And he designed this rifle. This one is, he, he, Paul Mauser was very big on safety because he had lost an eye when a gun blew up in his face, a rifle that someone had, was having him shoot, try out. So he was real, real big on, on the safety. So he built safety features into this rifle. If this rifle even had a ruptured case and blew up, he had it vent the gas out the bottom so it didn't go up in your face. I mean, this guy was really into making sure that this was a, this was a rifle that the, you know, the, the uh, German army or the German people would not have a problem with, or anyone else. Because these went up against us in the Spanish-American War. I believe this rifle here went up against the... Uh, and this rifle was also in the Boxer Rebellion in China. The German... There were seven contingents then in China. Uh, we were using... The, Craig Jorgensen and the, and the German army then was using this Mauser. So this is a 7.92 millimeter. It's, a, it's all, they call it the eight millimeter Mauser because they round that 7.92 off to eight millimeter. I had a friend in Missouri that used to hunt deer with one of these and he was very successful at it. So, so this is a World War I German Mauser. And we used to, when we, when we, in 1903, when we started, did our trials in picked the Springfield 9 aught 6 30 aught 6 full action rifle. It used incorporated the same exact mechanism 
because they liked that Mauser mechanism so much. It was such a good mechanism. And we paid the Mauser company, the United States paid the Mauser company to be able to use the patent on this bolt until we went into World War I and then we quit paying it. <laughs> so, um, you know, what else can I tell you about this? It's a very safe rifle. Uh, this is this rifle. If you cut cut it down just a little bit, shorten it a little bit, and you bent this lever down rather than straight out, sort of like it is, that would be the K98, which was the World War II rifle that the Germans used. It's basically this rifle with a bent down arm and shortened up a little bit at the barrel. So then, as I take it that again manufactured outside the United States was a millimeter and we were calibers? Yes, we were still using the 30 caliber designation. NATO has kind of pushed us more into the using millimeter, like our 5.56 or 7.62. Yeah, we use that now more than we do the same 30 caliber or whatever. But yes, two and a half million of those when the German army started World War I, whenever it started, there were two and a half million of those in the hands of the German army. By the end of World War I, there were nine and a half million of those. So they made a lot of those rifles. I, I don't know, research or not, is that the same rifle that went into World War II also? It, to, to reserve troops. Okay, yeah. they went to a different caliber. It like no, it's the same, same caliber, bullet. same bullet. Okay. Same gun. Next. And this thing looks like it was left in a tree, okay? This is probably one of the most iconic pistols ever made. This is the 1911. This one was built by Colt. This is probably a World War I firearm. Um, this thing has a history that is, is very interesting. Um, when we won the Spanish-American War, we were we took three places, the Guam, the island of Guam, the island of Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. And we sent troops to all three. When we got to the Philippines, we're going to talk a little bit here about the Philippine insurrection. There were people on the southern islands that didn't want us there. And they were called Moro tribesmen. And they didn't they were indigenous to the jungle. They didn't fight with guns. They fought with bayonets, okay, and Chris knives, which is a knife that has a wavy blade, kind of nasty looking thing. And they started attacking American troops. They would smoke hashish until they got very high, and then they would tie leather straps wet leather and tie it around certain parts of their body where they knew they were going to bleed out and make sure they didn't bleed out and then they would attack american troops with these okay now back in those days and this is from the philippines this is probably a moro knife from the philippines or machete we were using the military, United States military was using handguns back then that were 38 caliber, okay? It was a very anemic cartridge, 770 feet per second, 38 caliber. And they were, they were firing at these guys and hitting them seven, eight, nine times and they were not dropping. They keep hacking. You can imagine getting hit with something like this. I mean, they were, they were killing a lot of people. And they also believe, like some people believe today, that if you go to heaven when you die in a, in a battle, you get extra pleasures in heaven. You know, So it was like they didn't care whether they lived or died. And when this information, that all these guys were getting hacked up and this pistol wasn't getting the job done, when that information got back to Washington, the Ordnance Department said, well, we need a bigger bullet. We need a, a gun with more power. And they had some trials. And a gentleman whose name was John Moses Browning, and I'm sure many of you probably have already know who this is, decided he would jump into the fray. He was already working on a 38 semi-automatic like this for Colt, and he
And he said, well, I can just go to the 45. We'll up the caliber and go to a 45, and that will be a better, harder-hitting round. John Browning made his first gun at the age of 13. His first patent, firearm patent, was when he was 24. He designed not just this firearm, but he designed the M2 heavy barrel machine gun, which my father used in World War II. He designed the M1917, the M1919, and the FN high power. He, he was a prolific gun designer. Probably the greatest ever, I would say. And he's the one that designed this pistol. They had some trials, the military did. Um, Savage showed up, Colt showed up with this. Um, even George Luger from Germany showed up with a 45 caliber Luger. There were only like two of those made, like the old one. Um, but he showed up too. And they ran these firearms, they wanted semi automatic, they were getting away from the revolver. Okay, this was the new thing, an auto-loading pistol. And uh, they ran these guns through a horrendous torture test. Froze them, dumped them in water, dumped them in, and they had this fire each time after they would freeze the gun or they would dump it in mud. Or they, would, they fired 6,000 rounds through it, dipping it in water to cool it until they got to 6,000. And this firearm went through all those trials and never misfired once, never jammed once. And they said, that's the gun we want. And from 1911 till 1985, this was the sidearm of the United States from World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam. This was our sidearm. So for, what is that, from 1911 to 1985? That's quite a, long, quite a long time, almost the whole 1900s. This was the firearm of the United States military. Um, it's quite a gun, I'll tell you, and, and uh, I've always liked these. I don't know why, there's something about them that, that when I, even when I was a little boy, when I had a plastic gun, it looked like this, okay? I've always liked these. Um, this thing has a lot of knockdown power, and that's exactly what the Army was after. And these are still used by members of the military. Uh, Special Forces uses a, a, a model of this. The, I believe the Marine Corps recon guys still carry 45, 45 autos. So they're, they're still being used. They're still in business. And the Navy, I think, is also using a, a model of this, of this pistol. There are still, to this day, over 100 companies that are building and customizing this pistol. If you can imagine, that's a lot of, of firearm manufacturers um, because it is so such a good, good pistol. And I just happened to bring along a modern one. This is, a, and if you can see the, the similarity. They're still building this pistol, customizing it. What an amazing feat for a, for a handgun. You can't say that about a lot of other firearms. A hundred companies still making it. Okay, that's the Colt 1911. And again, there are lots of different brands. And they make them in different 9mm, 10mm, 45 ACP, 357. Okay, they make them 357 uh, Magnum. There are uh, several other probably calibers that I am can't think of right off the top of my head now. 40. Pardon me? 40. Yeah, 40. Yeah, they would make them in 40 caliber too. What's the military carry now instead of that? Uh, well, they did from 1985 to about... Five years ago, I think, they carried the M9 Beretta, which is a 9 millimeter, And then, I think the state troopers used to start it with those. Yeah, that's when we went switched from the 38, or the 357 in 1990, I think, we went to... M92, the M92 Beretta 92? Yeah. And now they use the SIG, uh, I think it's called the M17, but they, yes, mm -hmm. the SIG Sauer won that last contract. We went to Glock for a while, and then... Now they're, now I think they're using SIG. SIGs now? Yeah. Um, I was going to talk to you a little bit also about bayonets. Um, there's an interesting story on these things. This is a knife bayonet. And this is a spike bayonet. From everything I have been able to gather on these two styles of bayonet, 
according to wounds and everything else that I've read, this one is more dangerous than this one. Truly. They claim that this one will get caught on things. Sternum, whatever. Where this pointy little booger here, okay, <laughs> goes through things, all right? Um, clothing, <coughs> heavy clothing in the winter, trench warfare. This thing was pretty successful, okay? This is off a of French Lebel rifle. This, I believe, is it's a German bayonet, so I'm pretty sure it goes on the K98, which I don't think it fits on this one, but um, Mauser. And it's an interesting story of the first bayonet. An Austrian came up with the idea. The troops used to come together when they were battling and then go apart and come together back up, you know, regroup, retreat, regroup. He got to thinking in his mind, I carry a knife. What if I filed the handle down on my knife and stuck it in the end of the barrel when the troops were close? They would be using maybe a knife or a pistol, but I would have the advantage because I had the length of my rifle with my knife out at the end. So he made sure it fit good. They got into the next battle and he Got, they got close together, and he jams the knife down in the end of the barrel of his gun. And as soon as he does it, both sides regroup and retreat. So now he's on the battlefield pulling, trying to get this bit of bullets are flying by him. And he's trying to pull the knife out of the end of the barrel of his gun so he can shoot with it. And that's the story of the first bit. <laughs> I can just imagine how this guy was sweating, trying to pull the knife out of the end of the barrel of his rifle. And then someone came up with the idea, well, why not put that thing on the outside of the barrel and lock it in place? And there, now you have someone man it. So that's the story of the bayonet. I don't know a tremendous amount about bayonets, um, except that of all the things that I've read. This one is German. Bayonets are not used much anymore. Um, militaries don't even really hand out bayonets much anymore. Um, the last time an American soldier, American officer, said fix bayonets was in the Korean War. Now, that's a long time ago. People have to remember, we have rifles now that can shoot long distances. There's not a whole lot of troops that get up real close to one another anymore. And I think the bayonet kind of went out of use, you know. Um, that doesn't mean that soldiers don't carry knives. They do. But they don't carry bayonets very often anymore. Uh, this, can I ask a question? Yes. What year was the drop the triangle? Pardon me? What year was the drop triangle bayonets? When they first started using them? When they dropped them. Who used them? Oh, you know, I don't know. I do not know the answer to that. Because we've got some from Civil War up into 1900s. Yeah. Our Civil War soldiers used spike bayonets. Yeah. Yeah, and the French kept them because they thought they worked better than the other. And according to wounds, they did. Those things were, you know, they're pretty nasty. Once you got stabbed with a triangle, you couldn't be repaired. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting how they put this little hook on the end of this thing. This is to capture the other guy's muzzle of his rifle and move it out of the way. So his rifle barrel would go up through here, and you could twist and then pull back and use it, you know, against whomever. But that's what that's for. It's kind of interesting. Pretty ingenious. What was the actual bullet invented as opposed to the ball? In the United States, I would say probably the Henry rifle. But it was a rim fire. They hadn't figured out the primer part yet in the center of the back of the case. Uh, it was like a 22 long rifle, but it was a 44 caliber bullet. Yeah, I would say that probably was one of the first ones. And it's interesting you mention that because the Confederates hated those rifles. The Union Army is using a lever-action rifle that shoots 16 shots or something, and they're having to reload each one of their... They didn't have lever-action rifles. And what did that one... There was some South Carolina officer said that damn Yankee rifle that you can load on Saturday and shoot till Sunday or something like that. <laughs> but... Pardon me? Load on Sunday, shoot till Saturday. Till Saturday, okay, there you go. Yeah, the Henry rifle. 
Um, now the last thing I have to show you is this. Now this is a cavalry saber. This was probably no doubt used in the Civil War. I looked and looked and looked. I spent a week looking for the maker here. His name is Henry Ecker, and it's Solingen steel. So it's from the steel's from Germany. It could have been made in the United States, uh, or it could have been made in Germany. But the name is Henry Ecker, and I could find nothing on Henry Ecker except an auction that had one of these for sale, and that was all I could find on the maker of this saber. But you can imagine what this was for. I mean. This had a curve in it for a reason, because rather than use it this way, although you could, this was made to cut and slash while you were riding a horse, you know? And it, it, with the curve in it, you got a deeper cut than you would have with, and cavalry guys had curved swords like this or sabers, and the infantrymen usually had a straight, you know, blade, because they weren't on a horse, they were on their feet. But uh, you can imagine somebody coming at you on a horse with this thing, I mean, you know, it make you wonder, where's my pistol? You know what I mean? <laughs> so that's what this is, a cavalry saber. You know, Marshall County fielded the 12th and 13th Indiana Cavalry. Mary, my wife's great-grandpa, was in the 12th Cavalry. And I read uh, all the travels down through the south. They were. This could have been in one of those two cavalries if it was turned in here at the museum. I'm not saying it was, but it could have been. Very interesting. So... If you could put your brains in your teeth, you know, you could fight like that, you know what I mean? And that's pretty much what I have for you today. <coughs> Does anybody have any questions? And you're welcome after this is over to look at these fine firearms before I put them back and lock them up. So, does anybody have any questions at all? Yes, sir. Uh, what do you know about the Harper Ferry? The what? Harper's Ferry. Are you talking about the incident with John Brown, or well, the Harbury itself and the the weapons? I don't the Harbury's Ferry Model 1832. Okay, well then that's where it was made, and that was the United States Armory for years and years and years before Springfield Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts. So uh, I don't know much about them other than they they had a factory there that built weapons for the Army and Navy. Yeah. The factory. The Union burned down when they pulled out so the Confederates could not use it back then. Yeah, they, it's interesting. There was so much fighting in Virginia, Maryland. Towns would be overrun by one troop, and that evening they were overrun by another. They said the town of Winchester, Virginia, was back and forth, I think, like 80 times. The South owned it, then the North owned it. Um, that was quite a war when you stopped to think about it. It really was. You know, I don't remember, I don't know if any of you ever watched the PBS Civil War documentary that uh, there was a saying, I think Shelby Foote mentioned, there was some southern uh, politician who before the war said that, oh, there won't be much of a war, you'll be able to pick up all the blood with one handkerchief, yeah. you know. Sure. And yeah, he said that, and, and Shelby Foote said you, you could get a PhD trying to figure out how many handkerchiefs it would have took <laughs> for 600,000 some odd men, you know, that died. So, that's interesting. Anybody else have any questions at all? Just a comment. Yeah. Uh, when people ask, you know, when did this come in? When, you know, when did this invent and this and that? I've been through artillery museums uh, kind of throughout the world, mm -hmm. and uh, it's amazing that they were invented a long time ago. But when governments can afford to use them in mass, or you know, they had different criteria to use them, that's why the repeating arms didn't. There was a lot of them in the Civil War, but only a few certain units had them. But that's what the that's what was the deal. The government had to be able to afford them or not. It's a lot big difference between a four dollar rifle and a sixteen dollar rifle. Right. So. Yeah, and we went into quite a debt during the Civil War. We printed a lot of money that wasn't backed by gold, and we went into tremendous debt. And we since then we tried really hard to pay it back because uh, most 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 governments don't like being in debt. You know. So yeah. I'm just amazed though that the technology was there. They just couldn't apply it because of cost. Yeah, 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 that, it's, it's interesting how many inventions there were. When you stop and think how the 1800s moved on through, and this is all history, you know, uh, you saw things like, well, the, the mini ball was a big deal because it was all compacted. Instead of having to put in, you know, the powder, the patch, then the ball, 
you did all that in one swoop. So uh, that was a big step in the right direction. They said in the Civil War, a good infantryman could load and shoot three times in a minute. Well, that wasn't too bad. And then these guys come along with this Henry rifle where you can go lever, bang, 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 bang. You know, you don't have to load it each time. You just load it once and then you have all these bullets you can shoot. But you could just watch how time went by and the inventions got better and better and better, easier. Uh, telegraph, the telephone. I mean, you could just see the revolution of the industry. It, was, it really was the revolution was of the industry. Was the Henry an American? Pardon? Was the Henry an American? Yes, it was. Yep, the Henry rifle. Yeah. My first job out of college, just a little trivia for you, I was working at Crown Hill Cemetery, the third largest cemetery in the nation in Indianapolis, and I would mow around this giant monument, and the name was George Gatling. And George Gatling was the <coughs> venerable Gatling man, and I didn't didn't have you know Wikipedia back then, but I found out who George Gatling was, and he's buried there in, in Indianapolis. So. Isn't that interesting? interesting? I didn't know he was buried there. Yeah. I knew he invented that ri that uh, rifle, repeating rifle. Huh. Have you ever been to the Ford uh, Museum? Their gun collection. One of the biggest in the country. No, I have not. Uh, and what you were talking about, the revolution of how guns were made, they've got them set up that way, you know, and they got rifles with the revolvers on, you know, before mm -hmm. they went to. It's really interesting. It's it's really. Uh, Where's that, that, sir? At LaPorte. LaPorte. Yeah, just down the road, you know. Yeah, yeah. sir. Right there. And uh, it's yeah, actually it's one of the inside. larger yeah. gun collections. And it, so, they have uh, pieces from the Chinese. Era, you know, like 1600s and stuff. Well, and it's old match locks and stuff. Uh -huh. We put the punk and fired it. Um, just as a, just as something interesting, I think maybe for you, my great grandfather owned up until the time that he had to sell them all. He owned every gun ever made in duplicates. He owned three homes in Cisna Park, Illinois that were homes like you see down Jefferson Street here, the old Victorian homes. There was no furniture in the houses. The walls were covered with guns. Every three floors in each home, walls covered. There's pictures I have of someone taking a picture and you'll, you'll, you'll count 150 guns down a wall. And duplicates. He had old dueling <coughs> pistols, golden ivory handled, golden engraved. He had, he, he loved firearms. How many security officers did he have? <laughs> Al, he was a police officer, so he didn't have to worry, I don't think, a whole lot about that. But back then, there wasn't a lot of that. You know what I mean? And I have, I, I do Ancestry.com, and uh, I have found newspaper reports of people in this little town of Cisna Park, which is a, south of Chicago in uh, Iroquois County, of people coming over here from Europe and riding the train from New York or Philadelphia all the way to Chicago and then a carriage to his house to see his collection. Oh my gosh. This, this you know, he had that, that kind of a gun collection. This was your grandfather? My great grandfather. Great grandfather. Yeah. So you World War I vet? No, uh, Spanish American War. Spanish. Yeah. Yeah, my father fought in World War II. My grandfather fought in World War I. My great grandfather fought in the Spanish American War. And my great great grandfather was at Vicksburg. He was with the 76th Illinois Infantry. I have a piece of the surrender tree at my house oh, from Vicksburg. Wow. So, had been a, it's an old, it's old piece. <laughs> where, where were the police officers at? Uh, uh, Mount Carmel, okay. Illinois. So, it's about a town, about maybe a little bit bigger than Plymouth, right there on the Illinois River, I think. So, um, yeah. So I've been around guns a lot. My you know family has always been around guns a lot. So, has anybody else got any more questions? Yes, Francis. Uh, I'm sorry. I was going to ask. Could you? I, Compared to the wounds they could make for their uh, power or whatever, which which was better? Because I've always heard the mini ball, like when somebody got shot, it was a dull thing. It wasn't sharp, and so it caused, that was why they had their semi amputations. So in a way, was that worse, or was it? Was it, was it a worse uh, injury? Like it's I, the I think a lot of wounds depend on where they hit you, for one okay. thing. But the I have some mini balls at my house that were picked up at Shiloh. And to give you an idea, and I imagine, I don't know if you ever read anything about that battle, I imagine a bunch of them were dropped there. 
Um, that was a nasty battle. Um, they are 58 caliber. They weigh about an ounce and a half. These things are nasty. I mean, this is a big, yes. big bullet. And traveling at about 900 feet per second, it doesn't ricochet off a bone like something would today. It would literally break the arm completely. They'd have to saw it off, I mean, above the break. Um, yeah, they were devastating, you know, because of, of the size of the piece of the lead. It'd be like getting hit with a shotgun slug. I mean, nasty stuff. So, war, war is bad, bad stuff. So, uh, anybody else have any questions? Yes, ma'am, you had... Yeah. Yeah, I wondered how many uh, weapons are in this museum's collection. I don't know. I didn't count them all. I would imagine there are uh, maybe 15, just a guess. And that includes knives and things like that, you know, bayonets, things like that. Does anybody else have any questions? Any at all? Well, I would like to say one thing before I finish today. I am a volunteer here, and I, and I, I try to help out when I can. And... I have never in my life seen the volunteer spirit that this museum has and the hard work that the gals that work here put into these exhibits, these historical things. It is unbelievable to me, and I think personally, rather than give me a hand, give these gals a hand that work here and do it. We appreciate it. Volunteer. I see a lot of our volunteers in the room. So anybody else that would like to come volunteer, we'd love to have you. Thank you, everyone, for coming today.